you blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly things in Christ. And Moses spoke, Father, about blessings of basket and store, material blessings. You blessed us with that also. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? That's the big question. Oh God, help us, we pray, to transform us really is the word that we mean. Dear Lord, take up the tangled strands where we have wrought in vain that by the skill of art dear hands some beauty may remain transformed by grace divine the glory shall be thine to thy most holy will O Lord we now are all resigned. Thank you for being so good. Help us to be good, to be godly, a channel for you in Christ's name. Amen. Just one text, one verse, First Timothy one five. says, now the end of the commandment, one translation says, the goal of our instruction. And I like that. This charity, that's love. One translation says, the goal of our instruction is love rising out of a pure heart and out of a good conscience and out of faith and fame. That's my text. The goal. In talking with a guidance counselor one time, she said, there are a total of 40,000 possible vocations you may take training for and seek work in. We never tell the students that or they give up. We tell them there's 400. This text is not talking about vocational goals. It's talking about the goal that God has for every Christian believer. The goal, the goal of our instruction is now he goes on to say, from which some having swerved, one translation says, from which some not aiming at have turned aside the vain jangling to empty talk, one says, to a wilderness of words. They've missed the mark. If you shoot at a target at a hundred yards, and you miss the bullseye by one inch, and then you put the target on the sun and miss it by the same incident, you miss it by 8,000 miles, which is to say, if you don't have the right goal, the further you get down life's journey, the further you get away from the truth, you know. If I don't have the goal that God has in mind for me, I'm going to miss it. And the longer I travel without it, the further away I'll get. Now, this is a powerful verse, very powerful. The goal of our instruction is love. Love. But how do we get it? People often ask, well, how do you get filled with the love of God? This text makes it very clear. Love rising out of a pure heart. If you don't have a pure heart, you'll never be filled with the love of God. This is where it begins. In a meeting with a group in the States one time, an evangelical group, I used the illustration. I said, you know, some people, their minds are so corrupt. They can't look at a rusty tin can or a cardboard box sitting in a ditch, but they have to think something evil. After that meeting, a man came up. He was a millionaire five times over, and he said, you know, he said, when you used that illustration, you were talking about me. He said, that's the kind of a mind I have, and I feel awful about it. I don't know what to do about it. He said, could you bring a, a message in this series of meetings on blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God? I said, I'd be glad to, so I'll tell you something. I fasted for two days before I brought that message, you know. Blessed are the pure in heart. Oh, how happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Oh, how happy, a pure heart. After I preached that message, some while after the fellow came the same day, and he said, oh, Bill, I've got it. i got a pure heart. He was just jumping off the ground. 
I remember once in Edmonton, Buell Alliance, and there was a fellow, he was a pastor, but not from Buell Alliance, and he was attending the meetings, and God spoke to him, and one night he came for counseling. So my song and I took him into a back room, and, and he said, I'm hooked on pornography. I'm so deeply hooked, I think I've got demons. He said, I think of nothing else day and night. I've led my wife into this. He said, I'm, I'm going to have to leave the ministry. I can't, I can't get any victory over it, and I don't know what to do. So we checked it out. There's no evidence of demon activity. And I, I pointed out in James, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. I said, it's you. You have to take responsibility for this. And finally he saw it, and he started to pray. And he got praying louder and louder, and his body was snapping back and forth. I thought it was going to break in two at one point, you know. And all of a sudden, after about four minutes or five minutes of this kind of praying, he laughed. He just roared with laughter. You could almost hear the chains hit the floor. And he was free. Oh, he said, I've got to give my testimony tomorrow night. I said, okay, don't talk about the porno problem. That won't be edifying. It's a shame even to speak of those things that are done in secret. You know, the Bible says that. But just tell how Jesus set you free from a great burden you had. Okay. Well, the next night he came to give his testimony. But he decided to sing. You know, right? I think I met some of you have heard this before, probably. But it's so fitting, you know. He, he said, I want to sing without accompaniment. Oh, happy day that tricks my choice on thee, my Savior and my God. And he started to sing. And while he was singing, I can't explain it, the Holy Ghost came. And the whole congregation began to weep. And he got to this part, now rest my long, divided heart, fixed on this blissful center rest, nor ever from my Lord depart, with him of every good possess. Then he began to weep. He couldn't sing any longer. And we had a great weeping time in the presence of God, you know. See. God can give us a pure heart. Don't stay the way you are. If you don't have this, you can have this. The Bible says, as for the pure, his work is right. Which means if your heart's not pure, your work can't be right. Okay? That's what God says, but I believe it. He that loves pureness of heart, the king will be his friend. It says in the Proverbs, you know. So, get rid of that garbage, you know, by the grace of God. And get honest with God. Weep if you have to. God's recipe for personal revival is found in James chapter 4. Draw near to God and He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, your sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. He'll do it. Give Him a chance. But you've got to be ready to give it up. In the Senate Boy, Saskatchewan, you know, this guy came. I'll never forget him. Big guy. And he and his wife had been in the missionary meeting three weeks before. And they'd gone forward to dedicate themselves to missionary work. They both felt they needed to do this. <laughs> but he said, we can't go into the ministry. I said, why not? He said, we're hooked on pornography. And he told me, he said, we buy the filthiest, the most salacious things we can find to show them. We look at them. We practice this stuff. He said, it's, it's awful, I know. I said, do you want to be free? No. He said, I don't. So what do you do? So then I said this. Before you go, you claim you're a Christian. Yeah, I've been saved. I said, every time you're watching that rotten garbage, you're forcing the Christ who lives in you to watch it with you. Do you know what happened? He fell on the floor. He started to cry. I wept and wept and wept. And wept. He kept crying, oh my God, I didn't know what I was doing to you. I had no idea. I'd never thought of it. Can you forgive me? went on and on and on. And finally he was clear. And the last I heard is in Bible college, they're going to the mission field. You know. God can do it, but oh, do people. Holy Ghost, 
We've got to keep crying for the Spirit of God to come down on our people and speak to them and fast and pray until it happens. The goal of our instruction is love, rising out of a pure heart, and then it says, out of a good conscience. If you don't have a good conscience, down in uh, Chile, they brought a guy to me one night, the, the interpreter did, and I said, now, this guy doesn't know any English, so we can talk about, about anything we can, and he won't know what we're talking about. But this guy's gone to every consulate in, uh, in Santiago, which was a city of four million or more, Every missionary, every preacher, anybody that he hears as a counselor, he goes to him for counseling, he never does anything he's told. Okay. You tell him from me that I have more time for him because he's gone all kinds of counseling. He never does what he's told, so he doesn't even do what I tell him either. So he tells the guy this, and the guy looked startled, and the tears started down his face, and he said something, and the guy said, well, he wants you to pray for him before you go. I said, no. The Bible says pray for us for we trust we have a good conscience. He's got a bad conscience, and he said that. There's no point in me praying for him. He's got a bad conscience. You tell him he's got to make his conscience right, and then we'll pray for him. So he told him that, and I just walked away. The next night, he came back with the counselor. He was talking so fast. The counselor couldn't make him out at times, you know. What he wanted to say was, thank you, thank you, thank you. He went back from the meeting the night before after what I said. He got on his face before God. He spent hours with God. And he dealt with everything God showed him. He had a clear conscience. He wanted me to pray for him. I prayed gladly for him. But you don't get the love if you don't have the good conscience. And don't let the devil or anybody else talk you out of making some restitution that God is asking you to make. You know, my dad... Uh, retired and went to live at Car Carmel, Car California, and he met a guy there. He, my dad was in his 70s. This guy was in his 40s. He became fast friends. And my father bought a, an acre of land from this friend of his where he built a little house. But they didn't have anything on paper, and this younger guy died of a heart attack, and a, and a millionaire bought the land, and then came one day to see my dad and said, I own all this land now. My dad said, but I own this house. And they had a little argument there, and finally my dad went and discovered that as long as he lived in the house, this guy couldn't kick him off, and this guy couldn't stop him from traveling on the little road he had. The law said that. Well, then my dad was not feeling well. He came to see us in Canada, and he died while he was seeing us in Canada. He never did go back. And we got his belongings, and in there we discovered he owed a certain fellow $2,500. So uh, the date was about 25 years or something before. So I wrote the guy. I didn't even know if he had the same address. He did have. And he said, yes, but your dad and I were, were good friends. This was another film, not the guy that died, of course. And uh, he said, let's forget about the $2,500. But I couldn't forget about it. And the Lord said, I want you to pay that. You know. But I didn't have $2,500. You know. So I was praying about it. And there's a guy in Vancouver named John McDonald. And God had touched his life in some of the meetings we had, and he got turned around, and he was, a, he was in real bad shape. And when God broke him, he, he had a Bible in his trunk his mother had sent with him when he ran away from home or whatever, and he found this old Bible, and he went to see his wife. He hadn't been with her for a couple of years, and he rang the doorbell, and one of the kids came around the bank and said, Mom, Dad's at the door. I think he's drunk. He's got a Bible, and he's right in, and he's crying. <laughs> She invited him in here. He met with God. He got his life all straightened out. And then he told me he was making things right. And he had, it was costing him a lot of money. And he said, you know, my wife says, boy, if we lose the house, she says, I'm through. I don't know what I'm, I'm just going to take off. If we lose the house, we lost all the stuff they had. They had a lot of property and that and making restitution. So we prayed he wouldn't lose the house. And he never did lose the house. But he said, I've got a fund, you know, and... Uh, we had been talk I'd been talking about my father down in what had happened down in California, not thinking of him at all, just we were sharing some things, and he said, you know what, 2500 he said, you know, I've got about $3,000 in the fund here. This is money that I should pay to somebody, but they're dead, so I can't pay it, so I'm going to send that to your, this guy in California. And so he did, you know, and that's how it got paid. Yeah. You might say, well, I didn't pay it. No, I didn't pay it, but somehow God got it paid. I didn't have the money to do it, but God has ways, you know, okay? But a good conscience. 
I, I once, many years ago, in my woodcutting days, I cut wood for a church. They wanted 10 cords of birch, and then they wanted 30 cords of, um, not jack pine, oh, anyway, it was a, another, a pine. And I knew I couldn't make any money on the birch, but I knew I could make money on the other, the tamarack, it was. And so they wanted me to deliver the birch, first of all, which I did. And once I delivered the birch, they told me they didn't want the tamarack. This is the church, you know. So they had cooked me, you know. Then, you know, the birch was cooked, and when I piled it, I don't think I did this deliberately. I might have. I don't think I did, though. But uh, one day, when they got it, it was about two-thirds of what it should have been. So they came back at me, and I laughed and said, yeah, you cooked me, and I cooked you. It's fair, you know. So, and then the Lord, one day, he reminds me about this stuff, and I said, hey, God, you, you mean this stuff that happened in Pine Falls? Yeah. So I had to write them and send them a check, you know, and make it right. And then one day down in the States, the Lord reminded me that as a kid, I used to steal toys in the store in Winnipeg. And... Uh, so I said, but, but God, I was only five years old. And the Lord said, yeah, that's right. But make it right. So I wrote the story and sent them a check, told them what I'd done. Never heard anything back, but God had a reason he wanted this done, you know. What did he do? There's three of us. The first guy picked up the toy and off it. Then he laid on the side of the tongue. And this guy going by. That's what he's going there, you know. So we thought, but... It sounds like nothing, but you know, when God speaks, you've got to deal with it. Whatever it is. You've got some books you bought from some preacher, you never returned them, you better get them back or you'll be in trouble. I've got 40 books out right now I'm trying to get back, you know. Christians aren't all that honest. Well, I have to say this at the same time. A friend called me one day, a new Christian, and he was really, he was uh, struggling and whatnot, and... So I said, I've got a book here I think you should read. And I gave him this book from my library. He opens up the book, and his name was on the first page. It was his book. I bought it from him before, and I didn't even know about it. <laughs> so, some cra crazy things happen sometimes. But if you ask God to show you what has to be done, he'll show you. And it'll never be beyond your ability. The, the will of God is three things. Good, so it's not bad. It's acceptable as something you can do. And it's perfect so you can't improve on it. So why not go for it? Good, acceptable, and perfect. And sometimes you can lead people to Christ. I would like you in some of our meetings. She'd been in a store, been trying purses on her arm, and she walked out with a brand new purse on her arm, with three blocks down the, before she realized what she'd done. She thought, if I go back, they'll arrest me as a, as a, as a crook, you know, that I stole a purse, so she didn't bother well, in our meetings, God spoke to him, so she went back, and she looked up the manager and told him what had happened. And she said, he started to cry. He said, lady, I've been in this business 25 years, and the first one that's ever come back. We've had hundreds of things stolen over the years. You just made my day. And he said, forget about it. This is wonderful that you came back, you know. And I've known a case where people got saved when somebody went to them to make something right that have been made wrong. It's so easy to be wrong and do wrong things when you're not walking in fellowship with God. And deal with it. When God speaks to your heart, I've had to do this kind of thing as well. Love rising out of a pure heart, out of a good conscience, and then out of a genuine faith. What's faith? The best definition of faith I can find is in the book of Acts. When Paul said, he said, last night an angel spoke to me and he told me that the ship will be destroyed but nobody will lose their life. And then here's what he said, which I think is a good definition of faith. Wherefore, sirs, I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Faith, mighty faith, the promises and looks to God alone. Last hand and possibilities and cries, it shall be done. And cries, it shall, it shall be done. And cries, it shall, it shall be done. Last hand and possibilities and cries, it shall be done. Right? 
Okay, I'm not a singer, you just found that out, right? A genuine faith. Believe in God. God said it. 7,487 promises in the Bible. That's right. And all of them are true. They don't all apply to you. But I'm sure if you tried, you could find a thousand that would fit your case. You know. Then we learn to walk by faith. God leads us. And you never go wrong following God. And you never go wrong doing what God is asking you to do. The promises. Love rising out of a genuine faith. Let's look at this love thing for a few minutes before we sign off. Amnon, one of David's sons, fell in love with a girl called Tamar. He loved her so greatly he couldn't eat. And had a friend named Jonadab, and he had a bad friend that got him into trouble. He lost his wife, but he was his friend. Be careful about the friends you pick. And he asked him why he was, you know, the king's son and looking so sick. And he said, I love my sister Tamar. And so Jonadab gave him a little plan where he'd get alone with Tamar and rape the girl. And he did. And after he raped her, it says, he hated her, the Hebrew says, with a great hatred, greatly. Now how could it change in ten minutes, you know? He loved her so greatly, now he hates her with a great hatred, greatly. He was in love with her body, not with her. When he got what he wanted, he hated her. And he ordered her out. Now she knew, and he should have known, the law of Moses said, in a case like this, the guy's going to marry the girl. And she said, in sending me away, you're doing worse than you've already done. And he didn't see it, so he called his servants in and he said, get this woman, no, no, the word woman's not there. What he really said was, get this thing out of here. So they pushed her out, and she went home crying, and Absalom found out what had happened, and two years later he had this guy killed. Then you have a parallel case. It says about Saul in 1 Samuel 16 that Saul loved David greatly. In chapter 18, he tried to murder him with a spear. I mean, what kind of love was that? He loved David strictly for what he got out of him. When the spirit, the evil spirit, terrified him, which is the word in the Hebrew, it terrified him, he called for David, and David would play and sing, and he would be refreshed, and he'd feel better. He loved them for what he could get out of them. It wasn't really love at all. It was a totally selfish thing. Love seeks not her own. Love is always looking for somebody else it can bless. And be a help to, maybe a challenge to. That's human love we're talking about. Divine love. Many examples of this in the Bible, outside of the Bible. Well, David, for example, when he was looking for men from Saul's house so he could show the kindness of God to his former enemy. That's love. Because, I say again, love does not seek her own. Always looking for others they can bless. And there's lots of people around that need the blessing of God. And we're the ones that have to do it after all. This is the goal of God's instruction to us as Christians. We have to have a pure heart. We've got to have a clear conscience and a genuine faith. And when these things are there, then the Spirit will fill us with the love of God. I don't know if you ever read, oh, it was, I forget the title of the book, oh yes, Apostle of Abiding Love, the great man of God from South Africa. And he prayed a prayer about the love of God. It's an incredible prayer. 
I, I knew it at one time. I've forgotten it now. It was some years ago since I memorized it. But it was a fantastic prayer. He wanted, he wanted every cell in his body and every atom in his being to be imbued and endued with the love of God so that no matter where he went or with whom he met, he could pour the love of God on this person in some practical, helpful way. The love of God is shed abroad or poured forth in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given unto us. When people talk about Moody's experience of being filled with the Spirit, they overlook that this is what he said. I felt as if I were being fanned with gigantic wings of love. I felt I could take the whole world into my heart. He preached the same sermons he preached before. But the sermons which before one, twos, and threes to Christ, now one hundreds to Christ. And Finney had the same experience. People overlooked the fact he talked about being baptized with the love of God. He thought he would die. The love was so great. Poured into his being by the Spirit of God. You know, when it talks in Ephesians, rooted and grounded in love, Rooted and grounded in love, goes on to say, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. A doctor friend of mine and his wife, they went to China on holidays, and when they were gone, they left their four kids with her parents. They were a godly couple. And uh, one day, the grandparents were taking these kids for a walk, and a drunk teen teenager ran into them and killed the mom and the dad, the grandma and the grandpa. The kids weren't hurt. They had to get this couple back from China, and they came back. My son-in-law had the funeral for the two grandparents that had been killed, and the daughter, whose mom and dad died, she made inquiries, where is this guy that ran into my mom and dad and killed them? They told her, well, the police have him. He's in jail. So she went and begged permission to talk to him. How would you handle that? Here's what she did. She simply said, you killed my mom and dad, and I miss my mom and dad very much, and I wish they were still with me, but I want you to know that I forgive you for Christ's sake. I forgive you for killing my mom and dad, and I want to talk to you about Jesus. And she led him to Christ in the cell, you know. How could she do that? But she did it by the grace of God. She realized God had a purpose in this. He took my two parents. But now this young guy is saved by the grace of God. You know. The love of God. You, you can't read it. You can't learn it from a book. You can't learn it by watching somebody else. People, when our heart is right, the goal of our instruction, then I say in closing, is to love, rising out of a pure heart, a good conscience and a genuine faith. And I know what's happening in some hearts. The devil is telling you, forget it. You can't deal with that. It's too big. It happened long ago. It's not important. Don't you say that. If God is talking to you about something, say, yes, God, I'll do it. And God will give you grace in doing it. Some Christian relatives got a hold of this guy before he died and they wrote a new will and cut this kid out so he never got a nickel and had him sign it and so they got everything, he got nothing. He found out what happened. And he hated those people with a passion, you know. Then he was in one of the meetings and God spoke to him, broke his heart. So he gave his testimony. He told us what had happened and then he said, you know, I love those people. I really love those people that did this to me. I don't miss the money at all, he said. He's just full of God, you know. See. And God does things like that. He puts us through. There's a verse that says, Thou hast lifted me up and cast me down. And sometimes when God picks you up, He throws you down. He did that to Joseph. Joseph got lifted up. He was a slave, but he's put in charge of the administration of this big farm that this guy had, put a far hand, and all of a sudden he's in jail, accused of rape. He got lifted up and thrown down. Don't be surprised if that happened. You might get fired from the church you're in. Don't worry about it. It doesn't mean anything. Because our lives are in the hands of God. Listen. Well, people listen. 
The goal of our instruction is love. It's love. I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them. If you don't have it, don't sleep till you get it. Be filled with the love of God. There's nothing else quite so important. So somebody's saying, yeah, if you're filled with the love of God, people take advantage of you. Don't worry about it. I mean, they nailed Christ on the cross. They rewarded him for his love that way. So are you his follower? But don't worry about it. A pure heart, a good conscience, a genuine faith. This follows through, you know, on the Church of Christ because to be a proper member of the Church of Christ, it says in Hebrews 12, you are not come to the mount that might be touched in the burning of fire, nor into blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated the word should not be spoken to them anymore. But you are come unto Mount Sion, not to Sinai, but to Mount Sion, and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, or the universal gathering, one translation says, to the general assembly of the firstborn who are written in heaven. Christ is the firstborn, and we're his church, part of his church. You are come unto Jesus, says the mediator of the new covenant. Oh, let's pray. Father, my heart is melted as I think of these great things you planned for your children. Not Mount Sinai, Father, but Mount Sion, the city of the living God, the church of the living God written in heaven. Oh, Father, you told us not to rejoice because the demons are subject to us, but to rejoice because our names are written in heaven. Well, thank you for all of this. We pray for one another, dear God. Oh, Father, keep us. We may walk out of this room and throw it all off and forget about it. God, keep us from doing that. Bring us in repentance and humility again to the cross. Not my will, but thine be done. Empty us, Lord, that you may fill us, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen.